Sweet. How's it going, guys? It is uh, late at night. This is usually when I get my audiobook, audiobook work done because the house is really quiet, the family's asleep, and uh, we're also getting some new streaming stuff online. So I figure we try the new streaming stuff and uh, let you guys see what it's like to record some of Larkin Rose's The Most Dangerous Superstition audiobook. I thought that'd be pretty fun and uh, just like otherwise hang out so if you guys uh, want to chill and chat and listen and talk about whatever let's do it figure we'll try this for about an hour just uh, give the streaming platforms a good run through get some audiobook work done and uh, hang out so we are uh, trying to get set up with restream.io so it should be super simple. Like right now, you're streaming from my phone. Uh, hopefully out to Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and BitTube all at once. All pretty slick. So, And with everything except BitTube, I think anything you put in chat on Twitch or YouTube or Facebook should show up on this interface. So if you're watching, if you're hanging out on Twitch, YouTube, or Facebook, you know, Type a comment, type a comment, type something in chat or whatever, and let's see if I can see it here. And um, I'll get started on the audiobook here in a second. Mm hmm. All right, so we have looks like some viewers on YouTube as of right now. See how it goes. And so I can type back on Twitch and YouTube. Oh! Attack Helicopter Cat on YouTube. You type something. Sweet. I see that. Awesome. Now hopefully that message should get like copied over to the other platforms. So I think hopefully Twitch and Facebook will also see your message that you typed into YouTube. So if you want to check... If you want to check that, you can check our Twitch channel. Doug on Facebook! Dude, this is so working. Oh, this is awesome. Okay, so I can see chat from everybody. We're streaming to Twitch, YouTube, Facebook, and BitTube. And all your chat should be coming to one window. And you should all be able to see each other's, hopefully, if it works. I don't know. We'll see. But, uh, yeah, man, I'm doing great. I'm just... Um, Testing the new streaming setup, and I figured we'd like hang out while I do some of uh, some audiobook report recording in the middle of the night, like I usually do for um, Larkin Rose's *The Most Dangerous Superstition*, and just like hang out, test the new streaming stuff, chat about whatever y'all want to chat about. Look sleepy? Oh no 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 no! Like I got my. No, <laughs> I usually go to sleep like 4 a.m. So I am totally awake and ready to go. I'm just very comfortable right now. I got my house coat on. So, well, what I do is um, to make the house completely silent for audiobook recording, I kill, I turn off, you know, the, both ACs or both heaters in this case. I even turn off the refrigerator and my wife's fish tank pump because downstairs it makes just enough noise that my mic picks it up and like I'm like super anal about quality. Like I want this book to be the greatest thing ever created so hopefully that works hopefully it works well so the first thing we need to do and I can't really share my screen right now through this like I even had to turn off my main studio server because of the fans that's why we're streaming from the phone so we'll stream as long as the phone has battery um, the first thing we have to do is open up some previous work that I did and correct the mistakes that I found when I was editing it. So give me a couple minutes here. Yeah, so far I haven't heard any noise. I was worried that the the phone being right next to my um, my audio um, digital input <laughs> can't think of the freaking name right now. Uh, would be getting noise from the phone, but it's pretty good. It looks good so far. So 
So I'm done with the preface part one, two, three, and three A, except for some small tweaks. And then I have stuff to fix on three B, three C, and then we can do some new recording after that. So we're going to work on, I want to open up three B first. And I think it was just like one or two spots in each section. So this shouldn't take long. I'll show you my setup. I think we're pretty good here. I've converted, let's see if I can flip the camera around. There we go. So I've converted like this corner of the studio for audiobooks um, because like the primary concern is sound quality. So we have this sweet Focusrite audio interface uh, running from my kick ass tube mic. And so we, it's the, it's the, it's the condenser mic, not condenser. I forget the word, whatever, but it runs to that box over there. I don't know if you can see it. There's tubes in there and it gives it this really great sound quality. And then I moved it over here in this uh, sound housing with all this awesome sound insulation here, because when the mic is over here, anywhere near the desk, the sound like sets up this reverb between the table and like the ceiling up here. So trying to just literally get the best possible sound ever, ever, ever. Uh, there was somebody else from Facebook. I'm not sure if the Facebook messages sync across, but I can see them from Facebook. Doug was on. It's pretty late. I really didn't expect many people to be on, which is actually good because I didn't know if this was even going to work or if the streaming stuff was going to be set up. So I'm just going to chill. Okay, I've got two spots to fix. And so I got to find them. So basically, I pulled the book up and uh, I got an electronic copy of the book here on my tablet so that I wouldn't have page turning sounds to edit out. Like half of the work is just eliminating sounds that I don't want to edit out. Um, one thing that most people don't realize with audiobooks, and if you go listen to your audiobooks, you'll, you'll notice this after I mention it, is that there are no breathing sounds. And that's not magic. Like, the people recording these books do breathe while recording it. <coughs> uh, and so, you either have to do some fancy stuff to prevent the breathing sounds from going in the mic while you're recording, which is kind of hard, or you have to literally edit out every breath sound. So I've got like, um, I've just, I've worked out a system. Um, I take bigger breaths. I try and read more at once in between breaths so that there's less breaths to worry about. Uh, and then I do some tricks on the, on the computer here. <laughs> okay, bottom of page 53. And I know you can't hear the computer. You will hear it when I start recording it, probably. Okay. So, from how many soldiers? Probably not. Okay, got it. So basically like a paragraph we're going to reread. And I, I'm not sure what was wrong with it. I'm pretty sure my pacing was off. I think that's what it was. And what that means is... Uh, what that means is that I was reading too fast or too slow. In this case, it was... Three guys, one mic. What's up, man? Um... See, I see Twitch stuff on here too. This is perfect. This setup is so perfect. Like I can see all the platforms at once. This is awesome. Um, yeah, so <sighs> pacing is really important. And it's another thing that you never think about until you go to re actually record an audiobook. is that <sighs> I talk really fast, especially when I'm excited. And this book gets me really excited. Like I, I start getting all preachy about it when I get going. 
And so I, I noticed myself just really like getting into it and talking way too fast. Um, so you can have some variation in audiobooks, but you want to keep the speed slow enough because not everybody can listen as fast as you think they can. Uh, humans are different, right? Some of them can't process language as quickly as others, I guess. So, yeah. Okay, I'm just going to do a quick record check here. I'm currently unable to hear my mic, which is a problem. Check. Check one. Mic check. All right. I had all my effects on. The effects add a ton of delay, I've noticed. Check. Yeah, that's not going to work. That's fine. All right. We should be able to hit record here. Dude, I've never thought of that. This is cool to see because I listen to creep, creepy pastas every night. I can't imagine reading every day and every night. It's neat seeing it being worked on. It's uh, it's mind blowing to do the work, especially when I first got started. There is so much that goes into like voicing an audiobook that I just never thought. I thought it'd be easy. I thought I'd be like, oh yeah, I read to my kids all the time. I'll just hit record and read into the mic. Oh God, no. <laughs> nope, not anywhere near that easy. Okay. Mic check, check one, check one, two. That was good. I've got a lot of custom keybinds set up too. All right, let's do this paragraph, see how it goes. And you'll see how many times I re-record things too to get it like, to get it perfect, so let's see how it goes. <clears throat> How many soldiers went around harassing, threatening, or killing people they did not know before joining the military? Few, if any. How many police officers regularly went around stopping, interrogating, and kidnapping nonviolent people before becoming law enforcers? Very few. How many judges had people thrown into cages for nonviolent behavior before being appointed to a court? Probably none. The words, there's just so much wisdom in this book, I love it. And so, then I listen back to what I just did, because this is a fix. I want to make sure that this is final and I don't have to do it again. Mm. Sounds good. I'm not going to listen to everything back, but that is good. Okay, so that's done. That fix is complete. I think we have I think we have one more spot to fix here. <laughs> Creepy paste scary stories. Got it. Sounds good. Cool, man. <sighs> once you get a hang, once you get the hang of it, it starts it starts feeling good. Okay, next spot is going to be top of page 77. Once we get these repairs done, then we'll actually get to reading new stuff. And it'll go a lot faster. It makes you realize how long these books are. Page 77, top of 77. I'm just listening to the section to see what I did wrong.
Okay, so this sounds good, but I think what it was was that this was like the the tail end of like a six hour recording session and uh, I didn't take enough breaks. Uh, and what happens literally is your mouth muscles get tired and so your words start slurring and your enunciation starts falling off and usually like you're fatigued at the time so you don't necessarily notice it check one two check check uh, except we, when I was listening to it back I'm like God, I'm just like I'm missing all these words well I'm not missing them I was like it's soft pronunciation not perfect quality, which is what I'm going for here. I want perfection, because this is one of the most important books I think ever created. Uh, so I want to do it like as much possible justice as I can. How, let's see, three guys, one mic. How did you end up deciding to make an audiobook? So this is not my book. Um, this is something that I've... How did I decide to help? I've done other audiobooks in the past. I did, um, the last one I did was uh, Unschool Yourself First by Mark Beaumont. That was a book on unschooling, obviously, for, it was like an introductory thing. Um, I do this as activism. It's um, one of the ways I try and help the world. Check one, check, mic check. Um, a lot of the great libertarian work in the world is uh, limited to these nerdy publication websites like the Mises Institute and the, there'll be like articles that are you know 30 pages long full of like amazing libertarian like gold and I no one that I know except a couple nerds get anywhere near that stuff and so um, especially with these books like I know a ton of people that don't have time to pick up a book but they're in the car all the time and they just mow through audiobooks and so it's, it's a, a method of activism that I do to just try and get as much of this stuff in a format that uh, some of the people that might not ever get introduced to it get introduced to it. Uh, this book is The Most Dangerous Superstition by Larkin Rose. This is, a, this is a game changer for a lot of people. This book changed a lot of hearts and minds. So we're just going to hang out and stream and do the book. We have 62% battery left on the phone, so we'll just uh, continue from there. Check one, check. So this is a longer paragraph. I'm just going to cut this in and I'll edit it to perfection later. Here we go. Ironically, Probably in an attempt to hide the inherently evil nature. See, I, my pronunciation of inherently was really soft. I don't know if you noticed that. Inherently, inherently. Ugh. My mouth pisses me off sometimes. Ironically, probably in an attempt to hide the inherently evil nature of every government military and to distinguish its own mercenaries from the mercenaries of other tyrannical regimes, the U.S. military pretends that American soldiers have the right and duty to disobey any order that they deem to be illegal or immoral. However, not only is any soldier who does so likely to be court-martialed, but such a principle, which by itself would be quite proper, goes directly against the entire concept of authority and against the specific methods used to train soldiers to be unthinking, obedient tools of the regime they serve. In a combat setting, nearly everything that every government military does constitutes aggressive terrorism, and almost every order a soldier receives is an immoral order, whether it is to trespass on someone else's property blow up a bridge, block a road, disarm civilians, detain and interrogate people without justification, or kill complete strangers, just on the say-so of a supposed authority. All right, that one's done.
I'm just going to visually check it out. Mainly I'm looking for peaks. Because if I get too loud, sometimes I just get excited and I get too loud and it peaks and it ruins it. Okay. Alright, so that is it for part 3B corrections. I'm going to close that out. I think we have one or two corrections on the next part. And then we'll get on to reading new stuff. I'm really liking this stream thing. So I just it blasts it out to all the platforms at once and all the chat comes back here. And so like when we do Feed the Need, I'll be able to live stream to all the platforms for my phone, uh, assuming the internet works out in the middle of South Dallas. But the cool part about this is it's that it's a stream repeater. So my phone only has to handle streaming to one server, which then blasts it out to all the others. I love technology, so cool. Okay, we do only have one fix here. Let's see. Bottom of page 94. Oh, that's a real short spot. All right, easy peasy. All good, here we go. Real quick here. Check one, check, check. Good. Okay. This means that supposed authority is never what stops actual crimes from happening, and that an effective deterrent system does not require authority at all. This is discussed in further detail below. I didn't like that last one. This is discussed in further detail below. Done. Done with that part. Now on to the new stuff. What am I using? Uh, I'll give you a quick tour. So, flip the camera around here. Uh, so we just have my laptop here doing the Audition software work. I'm, I'm using Audition, I love Adobe software. Um, and so I've got a bunch of Keybinds set up. Actually, let me show you kind of what I'm doing here. So I create a new multi-track session like so. What's our next part? It's probably 3D. So we'll say, hold on, I can't type. I'm just gonna create the folder real quick. One sec, I'll show you. Part 3D. Just trying to label everything. That's another part, uh, another kind of difficult part is just keeping track of all the files because um, I, I don't know if you noticed, well, I'll show you right now actually. Uh, so I have a bunch of audio tracks here and I usually delete all of them except two. And I forgot the key binds for deleting them. Hold on. Control Alt Backspace. Control Alt Backspace. One second, guys. I can't hold the phone and show you at the same time. I'll bring it back up big here in a second. Okay, so um, I have my kick ass, super high quality tube mic. It actually connects to that little box right there that has tubes in it. And it gives it a really like super rich sound. Sounds amazing. Um, I have it in this uh, really cool like sound dampening enclosure. I've got my tablet up there with the electronic copy of the book um, into my Focusrite audio processor into Adobe Audition. That's kind of how this works. And so what I do is I set up a track like so. I enable it for recording. I don't know if you can see that. See, check, check. Mic check, check one. Okay, so I can hear that in my head now. Good, okay. And so then I have just a couple key binds. Basically, I hit record. Mic check, one, two, check, check. I take a breath. And then I continue talking with the next sentence, blah, blah, blah. Then I stop, take a breath. 
continue on, blah, blah, blah. And so that allows me to like in real time edit chunk by chunk and remove my breath sounds. And I have an undo button here. So if I want to redo something, it's really quick. That's kind of the setup that I use. And it allows me to like do this myself. Like I think the pros or whatever uh, have a guy like probably live capturing. Like in studio, they'll be running this equipment while the other guy only concentrates on his performance, which would be nice, but um, hey man, I'm trying to help the world here. It's not about being comfy. <laughs> All right, Just one more check. Mic check, check one, two. The next part will be part 3D. I'm gonna listen to that back real quick. <clears throat> Sounds good, okay. <coughs> That's the other reason I do it. It is a sweet setup. Um, it's because I, you know, I do the show in the studio, so I have a lot of the equipment that I need for this anyway. So this is just like another way for me to leverage the resources that I've already put into the channel activism. It allows me to leverage it in a new way for some really good activism. I really want to write a book one day. But the thought intimidates the hell out of me. <laughs> I don't, I'm not a writer, so... Uh, I want to help in other ways, and I think, like, voicing other people's books is something that I don't know if I have a talent for. I feel like I'm good at it, so. Okay. Pop 3D. <coughs> Part 3D. The effects of the myth on the spectators. The sin of non-resistance. Uh-oh. Uh-oh. I might disagree with this part. We're going to see. Let's see how it goes. I haven't read this part of the book. It is obvious that the belief in authority affects the perceptions and actions of law enforcers, and also affects the perceptions and actions of those against whom laws are enforced. But even the perceptions and actions of the onlookers those who are not directly involved, also play a huge role in determining the state of human society. More specifically, the inaction of spectators, who quietly allow legal coercion to be inflicted upon others, has an enormous impact. History is full of examples proving that Edmund Burke was right when he said that all that is necessary for evil to triumph is for good people to do nothing. The mass murder committed by the regimes of Stalin, Mao, Hitler, and many others was made possible not just by the willingness of the enforcers to carry out their orders, but also by their victims' imagined obligation to obey authority, and by the belief held by almost all onlookers that they should not interfere with the law being carried out. The perpetrators of mass injustice, including mass murder, are always hugely outnumbered by their victims. And if you add in the number of spectators, all those people who could have intervened, it becomes obvious how significant the actions or inaction of mere spectators can be. Oh, I love this book. Of course, some people will fail to intervene in a situation simply as a result of basic fear. A witness to a mugging who does not dare to intervene is not condoning mugging by his inaction. He simply values the benefit to his own safety that comes from inaction more than he values whatever benefit he thinks he could be to the victim by stepping in. But there are many cases in which the belief in authority makes people hesitate to get involved in a conflict, not just out of fear, but out of a deep psychological aversion to going against authority. There are two ways this can cause spectators to stand idly by while legal injustice is inflicted upon someone else. One, the spectator can believe that the injustice is actually a good thing because it is the law. Or, number two, 
the spectator can disapprove, but his willingness to actually act out against law enforcers, or even to speak out against authority, is stifled by his trained-in subservience. Either way, the outcome is the same. The spectator does nothing to stop the injustice. But the two phenomena will be addressed separately. I think I, I, think I fucked up phenomena. Uh, yeah, I fin I fl I phenomenad. But the two phenomena will be addressed separately. Good vocabulary is also helpful for this. I've noticed. <coughs> Just check chat. I don't want to leave y'all alone. Yeah, cool. Imagining legal evil to be good. There are literally millions of examples that could be used to demonstrate how the perception of the general public is dramatically affected by the belief in authority. Just consider how the average person views and judges an act when it's committed by one claiming to be authority, as opposed to how he views and judges the exact same act when it is committed by anyone else. Here are a few examples. 1. Scenario A. An American soldier in a foreign country is going house to house, kicking in doors, carrying a machine gun and pointing it at complete strangers, ordering them around and interrogating them, while searching for insurgents. Scenario B. An average citizen in his own country is going house to house, kicking in doors, carrying a machine gun and pointing it at complete strangers, ordering them around and interrogating them while searching for people he doesn't like. The first is viewed by most people to be a brave and noble soldier serving his country, while the latter is viewed as a horribly dangerous, probably mentally disturbed individual who should be disarmed and subdued at all costs. Number two, scenario A. An officer of the law is manning a sobriety checkpoint on a border checkpoint, stopping everyone to ask if they are in the country legally, or if they've been drinking, or to otherwise see if any indication or evidence of criminal activity can be found. Scenario B. A man without a badge is stopping every car that drives down his street, asking every driver if he's an American asking whether he's been drinking, and looking into his car for anything that appears suspicious. The cop who engages in such intrusive, obnoxious harassment, detainment, interrogation, and searching is viewed by many as a brave law enforcer doing his job, while anyone else behaving that way would be viewed as a psychotic dangerous. That, I think that mistake is actually in the book. Hold on. You encounter, you actually end up encountering a lot of actual mistakes in the book that no one notices because when you're reading it, you don't, when you're speaking it, you do. Is viewed by many. Is viewed by many. Is viewed by many as a brave law enforcer doing his job, while anyone else behaving that way would be viewed as psychotic and dangerous. Yeah, sometimes I have to sort of correct it. It's all good. Number three, scenario A. A child protective services worker receives a case file and based upon an anonymous tip, shows up at a house to question the homeowners. With the stated purpose of deciding whether they are fit parents or whether the state should forcibly take their children away from them. Scenario B. An average person, based upon a rumor he heard from a stranger, shows up at the home of other strangers, asking them questions and threatening to take their children away if the questioner is not satisfied with the answers. Again, the government worker is imagined to just be doing his job, while the average individual who does the same thing is seen as dangerous, probably mentally unstay. I messed that up again. Man. Gotta keep doing it. Again, the government worker is imagined to just be doing his job, 
While the average individual who does the same thing is seen as a dangerous, probably mentally unstable person. This is not to say that there could never be a situation in which a child should be taken away from his parents for the child's own protection. But such matters would be taken extremely seriously by any individual who had to take personal responsibility for his actions. A bureaucrat who is merely acting as a cog in the machine of government, on the other hand, will do such things with far less hesitation and less justification because he will imagine that something called... It's one thing after another. My mic is popping now. I'm having a little mic poppage. Check, check. government bureaucrat, right? Yes. A bureaucrat who is merely acting as a cog in the machine of government, on the other hand, will do such things with far less hesitation and less justification, because he will imagine that something called the law is solely responsible for whatever he does. Are you guys, is this, uh, was this a good idea? Are you guys enjoying this? You having a good time? I'm having a blast. Number four, scenario A. A pilot in the United States Air Force, having been given orders to do so, flies to the proper coordinates and delivers his payload to the intended target. The result is that some mercenaries of a different authority are killed, along with a number of civilians who happened to be in the area. Scenario B. An American citizen, acting on his own, loads up a plane with homemade explosives, flies over a building in the city where a vicious street gang is known to reside, and drops the ordinance. The result is that several gang members are killed, as are a dozen innocent bystanders who happen to be passing by on the street. The average American views the civilian casualties from the first scenario as unfortunate, but chalks them up to the hazards of war. The military pilot is viewed as a hero for having served his country and is given a medal. In the latter scenario, however, the average American views the pilot as a lunatic, a terrorist, and a murderer, and demands that he be put in prison for the rest of his life. <laughs> this is so good. This is so good. I love this book. <clears throat> whether an act has been formally declared legal by politicians, and whether it is being done at the behest of authority, has a huge impact on the perceived morality and legitimacy of the act. In a very real sense, those who do the bidding of authority are not even regarded as people, in that their behaviors and actions are judged by such a drastically different standard from those of average human beings. As another example, a lot of people would be alarmed at a report of a man with a gun in their neighborhood, unless they heard that the man also had a badge. I got a little incredulous there, but that's good. I think it belongs there. People judge behavior based largely upon whether such behavior has been authorized or forbidden by authority rather than whether the behavior was inherently legitimate. When citizens are called into an authoritarian court to serve as jurors in a criminal trial, for example, it is routine for the judge to tell the jury that they are not to concern themselves with whether the accused did anything wrong. They are to decide only whether or not his actions were in accordance blah, 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 blah. They are to decide only whether or not his actions were in accordance with whatever the judge declares the law to be. Of note, 
those in positions of power have, over the years, deliberately and methodically worn away at an old tradition known as jury nullification, whereby a jury could, in essence, overturn what they viewed as a bad law by returning a verdict of not guilty even if they believed the accused had actually broken the law. Every jury still has that power, but authoritarian judges do everything they can to keep jurors from realizing it. And that's the truth. There are some jury nullification activists in uh, Dallas area specifically that are out at the court like every single week uh, passing out pamphlets and jury nullification information. Trying to get jurors to realize that they can say not guilty whenever they want. <clears throat> uh, check out juryhero.com for more information on that if you're not familiar. So I'm slipping down. Even when not on a jury, most people still judge others through authoritarian colored glasses, judging the goodness of another based heavily upon whether he obeys the commands of politicians, i.e., whether he is a law-abiding taxpayer. Compare how the average citizen would view the two individuals described below. That's group described below. Start with compare. Compare how the average citizen would view the two individuals described below. That was better. Individual A has no driver's license, works under the table to avoid paying taxes, never registered for the selective services, owns an unregistered, unlicensed firearm, occasionally smokes pot, sometimes gambles illegally, and lives in a cabin which he owns, but for which he has no occupancy permit, and which has a deck on the back that he built without first getting a building permit. Individual B has a driver's license, pays taxes on what he earns, registered for the draft, owns a registered firearm, occasionally drinks beer, sometimes plays the state lottery, and lives in a government-inspected and approved government-inspected government-inspected sometimes plays the state lottery, and lives in a government-inspected and approved house with a government-inspected and approved deck out back. Mouth is getting dry. How are we doing? Phone's still got half battery. That's cool. Whew. Check on the streams. How's Twitch? Twitch good? Twitch says it's good. God, this is cool. I love technology. Very, very cool. How's YouTube? YouTube is live. Oh, so cool. Facebook? Awesome. I think we're good. I think we're good, y'all. I don't want to actually read the whole book on camera, but um, I figure if nothing else, this is like a teaser for the book. What are you using to go stream everywhere? Uh, so we've got a couple things. I have my streaming servers over there that can, with the CPU that I that's in that box, it could stream to two places uh, on its own, and then I have another machine in the other room. If I added it to it, I could do another two. But setting that all up every time I want to stream is a huge, huge pain in the ass. And so I'm using, or I'm trying for the first time, Restream.io. So I basically send it one stream, and then it repeats it out to all the different sources. And the really cool thing is it, it um, aggregates all the chat. So all the Facebook, Twitch, 
YouTube comments all show up in one spot so I can see it. It's really neat. What is Candles in the Dark? Candles in the Dark, Mr. Max Cranley, is, uh, there's some videos on it on our channel, if you want to Google it, uh, we talked about it with Larkin. It is uh, a seminar that Larkin Rose puts on. Uh, it's like a two-day event, and um, the point of it is to teach you how to... Um, I'm, I'm starting to get tired of the term red pill. It seems like a... Seems like it's played out, and it's got it's grown like a lot of bad connotations that are no longer good. But basically, how to open people's mind, how to spread the ideas of voluntarism and you know the libertarian ideas, the non-aggression principle, uh, how to make people realize that there is no such thing as a valid authority in the world, how to have conversations with these with people about these things that are usually such contentious, argumentative discussions. You know, like we see on Facebook every day, for example. Uh, but sort of like do it in a way that doesn't make it contentious and doesn't piss everyone off. And uh, it's basically a training course on how to change people's minds, for example. I, it's, it's amazing. I, I've, I, I went to one and, uh, in Arizona. It was amazing. I loved it. I learned so much. Uh, it was so useful that we hosted another one here in Dallas a couple months back. And uh, it was a huge success, and I think he did another one recently in Florida, and uh, he's doing another one at Anarchapoco in February. Uh, it's, it's super cool. Uh, three guys, one mic. I knew it. I've used it once. Plan to start using it all the time. Restream.io, that is. Yes, and if you check it right now, Restream.io has like a, a turkey day sale. Uh, if you pay for a year... You can get it for like 60% off, which takes the price from stupid, retardedly expensive to reasonable. What's up, NCAP? We're trying a new, uh, a new, uh, we're trying Restream.io so that we can kind of bring all different audiences together because my audiences on Facebook are uh, huge by far, second to YouTube and then everything else. And so Restream.io is like blasting it out. Yeah, we're just chatting. I'm actually recording an audiobook uh, and working on an audiobook um, and streaming from my phone to test the new restream thing. And so far it's working. We're going out to all the platforms and it aggregates all the chat from all the platforms back where I can see it. So, uh, Max Cranley, and now it's a book. Yes, uh, well, no. Um, the, the book is not A Candles in the Dark. The book is The Most Dangerous Superstition. And it makes the case that... Um, on your Twitch panel, change it to just chatting. Oh. Okay. Okay. Ancap guy is, is teaching me how to use Twitch. I'm still new. Dashboard. I'm new to Twitching. So in the category, change it to just chatting. Okay, got it. Boom. Done. Um... The seminar, Candles in the Dark, teaches you how to uh, wake people up to the ideas of non-aggression principle, voluntarism, libertarianism. Uh, it's in the TOS that all streams must be correctly placed. Man, Twitch has some rules. <laughs> they seem to have a long list of rules that I have to worry about. Uh, I don't know. I don't know, man. I don't know if it counts as an audiobook. I, I think my channel is far too small for them to care about, but um, it's all good. Uh, the book, The Most Dangerous Superstition, is on literally teaching people how the belief in authority is literally the most dangerous superstition to ever exist in the world. Uh, it's, it's, um, he wrote it years ago. The Candles in the Dark thing is only something he's been doing for the past few years. Yeah, definitely check it out. Uh, so you can get the book on Amazon, um, and when this audiobook is done, it will be available on Audible as well. Dude, come to Mixer. Mixer is great. What is Mixer? Is that another streaming platform? Because I can add it to Restream.io. <laughs> if it's a streaming platform, I bet it's on there. Mixer is micro suck. Uh-oh. Oh, snap. Shots fired. Like, if I'm using uh, Restream, I really don't care like what platform it is, right? Because it just kind of goes out to all of them. So maybe for gaming, stick to Twitch, 
Like when I do my gaming streams, I'll just stream those only to Twitch. And then for all the other random miscellaneous stuff, blast them out to all of them. That's kind of my current plan. Is Mixer more gaming or is it more anything general? Like I wish I could get everybody to, um, like all the people watching this on all of our other platforms, if you would go check out our Twitch, twitch.tv slash the not army and subscribe. I'm trying to get to 50 subs because that's a requirement for the affiliate thing. But um, it's all good. Watch on whatever platform you want. Mixer is a Twitch competitor, gaming too. Okay. All right. Well, I don't know how much latency Restream IO adds uh, if it's too much to use for gaming. I don't know. I mean, it seems like we're communicating or whatever. 50 follows. Got it. Okay. Roger. Cool, cool. Where did I leave off on the book? Okay. An approved deck out back. Trying not to be the that guy. What guy? Oh, I got dude, don't worry about it. You're helping me a lot on, on Twitch. You've answered so many questions of mine over the past six months. <laughs> it's good. It's all good. All right, I'm going to try and get through this section. Here we go. The two live... The two live... God, I'm never going to get anywhere. The two live otherwise similar lives, with both being productive, and with neither robbing or assaulting anyone else. Their behaviors, choices, and lifestyles are very similar in almost every way, except that there are laws against the actions of individual A, but not against those of individual B. Oh, snap. <laughs> Did that get in the audio book? <laughs> Let's see. Something happened. I heard a bling. Some, somebody did something. I don't have any notifications for that, apparently. So, whatever somebody did, thank you. Now, let me see if that bling got in the audiobook. It didn't. Sweet. <laughs> I was going to say, we'll just leave that in there. Not against those of individual B. Cool. That means turn the page. <laughs> You just followed me on Twitch. Cool, thank you. Call to action fail, absolutely. Well, thank you for the follow, I appreciate it. That alone, without any other substantive difference. Substantive? God, I am terrible tonight. It's probably because I'm streaming. That alone, without any other substantive difference in what they do, or why is it substantive? Substantive. Is that a word? Substantive? My brain is telling me that's not the word. Googling. Substantive. It's a word. Okay. My brain was telling me it was substantive or substan- I don't know, whatever. I'm an idiot. That alone, without any other substantive difference in what they do or how they treat other people, would cause a lot of people to view individual A with a degree of contempt. <laughs> and now there's a plane flying over my house. <laughs> this is what my life is like right now. Now we wait for the plane. Okay, okay, we're good. Waiting on the plane. So how y'all doing? <sighs> All right, plane is gone. That alone, without any other substantive difference in what they do or how they treat other people, would cause a lot of people to view individual A with a degree of contempt. 
while viewing individual B with respect and approval. In fact, if individual A was accosted, detained, and even physically assaulted, e.g. tasered, beaten, and handcuffed by law enforcers, even if he had never threatened or harmed anyone, many believers in government would opine that he had it coming and that he deserved to be attacked and caged for having disobeyed the commands of politicians. This tendency of onlookers to blame the victims of authoritarian violence is incredibly strong. One who accepts the superstition of authority. The idea that some individuals have the right to forcibly dominate others, and that those others have a duty to comply, will assume that if authority is using violence against a person, it must be justified. And therefore, the victim of such violence must have done something wrong. This pattern shows up in different situations. When, for example, U.S. troops kill civilians in some foreign country, many Americans are desperate to believe and therefore automatically assume, without a shred of evidence, that the dead victims must have been insurgents or collaborators, or at least sympathizers with the enemy. As another example, when the Branch Davidians near Waco, Texas were subjected to a military assault, followed by prolonged physical and mental torture, followed by mass extermination, many Americans were quick to assume that anyone that government would do that to must have deserved it. Max Cranley, I saw your debate against an ANCOM. Yeah, that was, uh, I'm not sure that was a debate, my friend. <laughs> it was more like sword fighting farts for an hour and a half. Um, there's an additional, are you talking about the libertarian socialist, I think? Uh, libertarian socialist. Uh, there is an additional 30 minutes that, um, is on the Patreon for the Patreon supporters that actually I get him to, like, Engage a little bit and admit some things? Interesting. Have you done any similar debates? Um, we've done a couple debates that turned out to be less debates and more... Um, they turned into conversations. I much prefer to have conversations with people because they usually are much more fruitful in changing people's minds. Um, but sometimes like a good public square bashing is... Uh, is able to change not the person you're talking to's mind as much as the people watching. Like, it's a different audience. So, like, that debate, I was more trying to figure out what his position was, and then I was going to engage in the, in, in the more rougher aspect to sort of meet things out for the audience. But he never would define what the hell his position was, so I never got to the contentious part. It was just merely trying to ask questions repeatedly and got nowhere. So that was a weird one. Um, Max says that Ancom seemed like he was having difficulties making his argument, and I am somewhat interested in where they are coming from. Three guys, one mic. What the hell is a libertarian socialist? It's a square circle. It is exactly what it is. It is a square circle. They exist. They exist. S SJWs defile and deface pretty much anything they touch, including the Libertarian Party. Uh, da -da -da -da. Must have deserved it. That's where I left off. Da -da -da. Right? Yes. Okay, we'll do that too, must have deserved it. Got it, okay. The American tyrants fostered this attitude by fabricating various rumors and... Try again. The American tyrants fostered this attitude by fabricating various rumors and accusations in order to demonize the victims of that violent, fascistic assault on nonviolent people. Actually, the incident was the result of a publicity stunt by the ATF, 
based upon rumors that some people in the group possessed illegal gun parts. Many people assume that if someone was assaulted, prosecuted, or imprisoned by agents of authority, then that person must have done something wrong and must have deserved what was done to him. What was done to him. What was done to him. Many people assume that if someone was assaulted, prosecuted, or imprisoned by agents of authority, then that person must have done something wrong and must have deserved what was done to him. This assumption may come from a refusal of people to consider the possibility that the government they rely on for protection is actually an aggressor. Or it may come from not wanting to consider the possibility that anyone, including himself, could be the next helpless victim of authoritarian violence, even if he's done nothing wrong. Regardless of the cause, the end result is that when evil is committed in the name of law, many spectators immediately... nope. Regardless of the cause, the end result is that when evil is committed in the name of law, many spectators immediately hate the victims and rejoice at the pain and suffering that is inflicted upon them. Boom. Boom! Obligation to do wrong. While everyone is aware that there are laws against robbery and murder, except when they're committed in the name of authority, the average person is completely unaware of the tens of thousands of pages of other government issues statu- God, I just messed that whole thing up, didn't I? Uh -huh. We're gonna do the average person. The average person is completely unaware of the tens of thousands of pages of other government-issued statutes, rules, and regulations, federal, state, and local. But even when they have very little idea exactly what the law does and does not allow, most people still hold a general belief that obeying the law is a good thing, and that breaking the law is a bad thing. In fact, even when a person is strongly opposed to a particular law, believing it to be unjust, he may still hold a general conflicting belief that laws ought to be obeyed and that it is justified to punish those who disobey. This psychological paradox is quite common, in fact, with many people vehemently lobbying to change what they viewed to be bad laws, while supporting the idea that as long as it is the law, people should obey it. Such mental contradictions are common in the context of the belief in authority, but are rare outside of it. For example, no one would argue that it is morally wrong to try to steal an old lady's purse, but also morally wrong for the old lady to hang on to her purse. I'm not sure that sounded right. Yeah, that is a commie. Yep, exactly. Such mental contradictions are common in the context of the belief in authority, but are rare outside of it. For example, no one would argue that it is morally wrong to try to steal an old lady's purse, but also morally wrong for the old lady to hang on to her purse. But the concept of a bad law in the mind of one who believes in authority, boils down to a similar paradox. A bad command, which is also bad to disobey. The spectator who believes in authority may view a particular command enacted by the masters and implemented by the enforcers as being unimportant, unnecessary, counterproductive, or even stupid or unjust. While at the same time, believing that people still have a moral obligation to obey that command, simply because it is the law. Examples of the effects of such a viewpoint abound, ranging from the mundane to the horrific. Here are a few. 
Boom, we passed page 100. I almost said 1,000. 100 pages down. That's awesome. So we're almost halfway done. Number one. At 2 a.m., on a wide open, straight, empty road running through unpopulated farmland, a driver slows down but does not stop at the stop sign at a cross street. A motorcycle cop, hiding a hundred yards away behind some bushes, turns on his lights. Almost everyone given those facts would agree that the driver did not harm or endanger anyone or anyone's property. And yet most people would agree that the cop would have the right to demand payment from the driver via a traffic ticket. In other words, even though they would concede that the only thing bad about what the driver did was that it was technically illegal, they believe that... Oh, they... In other words... In other words... Even though they would concede that the only thing bad about what the driver did was that it was technically illegal. They believe that that alone justifies the forcible robbery of the driver. Taking it one step further, if the driver attempted to leave the scene rather than accept the ticket, most spectators would agree that the cop would be right to chase down, capture, and imprison the driver. Number two, a government inspector from a state board of health conducts an inspection of a restaurant. The restaurant is perfectly clean and organized, and the inspector finds no indication that anything there poses any risk to anyone's health. However, he nonetheless finds several technical violations of the local code for restaurants. As a result of those violations, not because they create a danger to anyone, but because they are against the rules. The restaurant owner is fined hundreds of dollars. Again, even though the restaurant owner did not harm or endanger anyone or anyone's property, most people would view it as legitimate for the owner to be robbed by those acting on behalf of government. And if the owner attempted to resist such robbery, whether by trying to conceal the technical violations or bribe the inspector, or by refusing to pay the fine, he would be seen as immoral by most people, and the enforcers would be seen as having the right to use whatever means necessary to achieve compliance with the law. It's good stuff. It's good stuff. You look like Guy Fieri's less successful cousin. I appreciate that. Thanks. <laughs> oh, the internet! You're so full of joy and pleasantries. Number three. A man drives his friend... <laughs> I said that number three with attitude. I can't do that. I can't let the internet influence my attitude of the audiobook. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Calm center. In the center of Guy Fieri. <clears throat> number three. A man drives his friend home from a party. Knowing he would have to drive, he did not have any alcohol to drink, though his friend did. He drops his friend off and heads home. He notices the police doing a sobriety checkpoint traffic stop ahead, and remembers that his friend left his half-full beer bottle in the car. Knowing that it is illegal to have an open container of alcohol in his car, he covers it up. He has not harmed or endangered anyone. And in fact, he acted, in fact, and in covers it up. He covers it up. He has not harmed or endangered anyone, and in fact, has acted quite responsibly, acting as designated driver to make sure his friend would arrive home safely. However, he still broke the law, albeit accidentally, by driving a car with an open bottle of beer in it, and then tried to hide the evidence of that fact. If he was caught doing so, and arrested, few people would view the cop as the bad guy in the situation. Number four. A man sells a shotgun with a barrel a quarter of an inch shorter than the law allows. 
The weapon is no more lethal than a shotgun a quarter of an inch longer, and no one who is involved threatened or used violence against anyone. And no one who is involved. Did I say that right? Yep, said it right. Yes! But the man, having been caught with the illegal item, is subjected to a paramilitary invasion of his property, followed by an armed standoff in which several people are killed. Unfortunately, this example is not hypothetical. It happened to Randy Weaver at the incident at Ruby Ridge in 1992, and he was not merely caught selling an illegal shotgun. He was enticed into doing so by undercover law enforcers. The result of the armed invasion of the Weaver's property and the subsequent shootout and prolonged siege was that Mr. Weaver's wife and son were killed, and he and a friend were wounded. Though it would be absurd for anyone to claim that there is a moral difference between possessing a shotgun with an 18-inch barrel and possessing a shotgun with a 17 and 3 Though it would be absurd for anyone to claim that there is a moral difference between possessing a shotgun with an 18-inch barrel and possessing a shotgun with a 17 and 3 quarters inch barrel. Did I screw up inch? I did! Damn it! Though it would be absurd for anyone to claim that there is a moral difference between possessing a shotgun with an 18-inch barrel and possessing a shotgun with a 17 three-quarters inch barrel, and even though that allegation was the entire legal justification for the armed assault and confrontation, many spectators would still fault Randy Weaver, viewing him as the bad guy for having allowed himself to be coaxed into breaking an arbitrary, completely irrational, not to mention unconstitutional, law. That is the power of the belief in authority. It can lead many people to view a gang of sadistic, murderous thugs as the good guys, and to view their victims as the bad guys. To most people, breaking the law without specifying which law, has an automatic negative connotation. They view disobedience to authority not merely as dangerous, but as immoral. But to the government believer, something even worse than committing a minor victimless crime is openly disobeying an agent of authority. The average spectator, when observing the interaction between an authority figure and anyone else, will often view with disdain anyone who does not immediately and unquestioningly answer any questions and comply with any requests from a man with a badge. Even if the person complies but exhibits an attitude towards the authority figure, any attitude other than meek subservience, many spectators will be quick See, I'm getting into it, and I start reading faster. Uh, oh, I gotta remember to check chat. Y'all are hanging out with me. Uh, more successful than dude can take a joke. Yeah. Yes, all the way to Flavortown. Yep. Any info on the recording equipment setup looks like a legit rig? Yes. I'll show it again real quick. So, we have laptop running Adobe Audition. We have my Focusrite audio interface, which is baller, baller, baller. This is the second gen, the new one. We have a kick-ass uh, legit tube mic that its tubes are over there in that little box right there. It's literally a tube mic. That's It sounds like super warm and rich. We got it inside of a sweet sound audio enclosure. Got the book up there on the tablet. And, uh, you know, got sound soundproofing cloth on the walls. So going on here for real I'm trying to get like the best possible audio quality and I've like taken over my video studio so that's why we haven't been using the video studio for the show lately because because I think this is really important even if the person complies
Can y'all see okay? This is a weird angle, I know. It's just my phone. Even if the person complies, but exhibits an attitude towards the authority figure, any attitude other than meek subservience, many spectators will be quick to condemn the one who fails to grovel. And one who runs away from the police, even if he had done nothing wrong in the first place, is viewed with scorn by most. And when someone who runs or hides or refuses to cooperate is beaten up, tortured, or even murdered by law enforcers, many spectators opine that the victim should have done what the police told him to do. And when someone actively resists an authority figure, few have the gumption to take that person's side under any circumstances, even with mere words. Did I read that all too fast? Getting in. It's a little fast. Oh yeah, this mic's really sweet. I've had it for a couple years now. It's my favorite mic. I use it as much as possible. Just as a well-trained dog will not bite its master, even when sadistically... no. Just as a well-trained dog will not bite its master, even when sadistically maltreated, so those who have been trained to bow to authority are usually psychologically incapable of bringing themselves to lift a finger to defend themselves, much less someone else, from any aggression committed in the name of law and government and authority. Indeed, due to their authoritarian indoctrination, most people would more eagerly condemn their fellow victims than join together with their fellow victims. I said that weird. Indeed. Indeed. D nope, nope, nope. Indeed, due to their authoritarian indoctrination, most people would more eagerly condemn their fellow victims than join together with their fellow victims to actually resist tyranny. It was the second fellow, vict fellow victims that I wasn't expecting. Got weird. Weird in the mouth. There is, of course, a difference between saying that it is not smart for someone to do something and saying that it is immoral to do something. It is one thing to say that it is stupid for someone to mouth off to a cop, and another to say that doing so is actually immoral, and that one who does so therefore deserves whatever abuse or punishment he receives. The believers in authority often express the latter opinion about anyone who defies the police, regardless of the reason. The idea of average people imposing justice upon wayward law enforcers existentially terrifies statists, even when a law enforcer has done something as serious as committing murder. In the eyes of the well-indoctrinated, the only civilized course of action in such a situation is to beg some other authority to make things right, but never to take the law into one's own hands. People may complain about and condemn legal injustice, but few are even able to consider the possibility of engaging in premeditated, illegal resistance, even when agents of government are inflicting vicious brutality upon unarmed, nonviolent targets. Speaking of, I don't know if this is against Twitch's, uh, Twitch's TOS talking about <clears throat> armed resisting cops. Um, speaking of armed resisting cops, I gotta plug it. Uh, if you're in or around Dallas or really central Texas, our Feed the Need 6 event is coming up. It's the sixth year we've done this. It is illegal in Texas to feed the homeless. Just let that sink in for a second. It is illegal in Texas to feed the homeless without a permission slip from the government. Um, and they are literally, they have literally arrested people in other parts of the state for this. They arrested an entire church group in Austin or Houston, I forget which. And they went through this long court case. And the only thing that came out of the court case was that they basically uh, raised the limit. So you can feed a small, tiny number of people without a permission slip from the government. 
but if you feed too many, if you help too many people at once, they will literally attack you and arrest you. This is like the perfect spot in the book to talk about this. Um, we are the only group, I think, in the country, possibly the world, who breaks the law to feed the homeless but has never been harassed, accosted, or arrested in Dallas because we do so armed to the teeth. And that's coming up early December, December 8th, uh, in Dallas. So if you're in Central Texas and you want to donate and you want to help people against the law, if you want to break a bad law uh, and help people and do so in a principled, nonviolent way, but armed to the teeth, <laughs> then check out Feed the Need. Um, if you if you look up, uh, there's a link to our YouTube channel in the Twitch stuff. If you're on YouTube, you're already there. Uh, uh, look on YouTube for Feed the Need Five. We had, we did in a video we did a video on that on our Disenthrall channel. You can see exactly what we do. It's both hardcore and heartwarming. It's amazing. Um, and then there's a Facebook page for it too. I think it's Feed the Need 2018. You can look up for the, the Facebook event page if you're interested in attending that. So, that is that. I needed to plug that. Armed nonviolent targets. <clears throat> I think we're almost to a stopping point here. Uh, and if through prolonged brainwashing, a people can be rendered psychologically unable to resist the oppressions done in the name of authority, then it makes no difference whether these people then it makes no difference whether those people have the physical means to resist. Modern tyrants and their enforcers are always outnumbered and often outgunned by their victims by a factor of hundreds or thousands. Yet tyrants still maintain power, not because people lack the physical ability to resist. Yet tyrants. Yet tyrants still maintain power, not because people lack the physical ability to resist, but because, as a result of their deeply inculcated belief in authority, they lack the mental ability to resist. As Stephen Baiko put it, the most potent weapon in the hands of the oppressor is the mind of the oppressed. I think I mic popped on that. Nope, got it. How much longer is this section? Oh, it's real long. All right, so we're gonna do one more piece, and then we'll call we'll call the audio booking for today. Double standard on violence. The double standard in the minds of those who have been indoctrinated into authoritarianism when it comes to the use of physical force is enormous. When, for example, a law enforcer is caught on film brutally assaulting an unarmed innocent person, the talk is usually about whether the officer should be reprimanded or maybe even lose his job. If, on the other hand, some citizen assaults a police officer, nearly everyone will enthusiastically demand, often without even wondering or asking why the person did it, that the person be caged for many years. And if a person resorts to the use of deadly force against a supposed agent of authority, hardly anyone even bothers to ask why he did it. In their minds, no matter what the agent of authority did, it is never okay to kill a representative of the god called government. To the believers in authority, nothing is worse than a cop killer, regardless of why he did it. Powerful words. In reality, using deadly force against In reality, using deadly force against one who pretends to be acting on behalf of authority is morally identical to using deadly force against anyone else. An act of aggression does not become any more legitimate or righteous simply because it is legalized and committed by those claiming to act on behalf of authority. And using whatever force is necessary to stop or prevent an act of aggression, whether the aggression is legal or not, and whether the aggressor is a law enforcer or not, is justified. 
Of course, the Riz. Of course, the risks involved with resisting legal aggression are often much higher, but that does not make it any less moral or justified. Many of the reasons now used by law enforcers to forcibly take people captive, such as engaging in peaceful public demonstrations without a permit, or photographing law enforcers or government buildings, or not submitting to random stops and questioning by law enforcers, have no shred of justification when viewed without the authority myth. As such, resisting such fascist thuggery, even if it requires deadly force to do so, is morally justified, albeit extremely dangerous. But most people are literally incapable of even considering such an idea. Even when they recognize unjust oppression, they imagine that the civilized response is to let the injustice happen, and then, later, beg some other authority to make amends. Whew. When faced with legal aggression and oppression, there are only two possibilities. Either the people are obliged to allow law enforcers to inflict all manner of injustice and oppression upon them, and then complain later, or the people have the right to use whatever level of force is necessary to stop such injustice and oppression from occurring. To say, for example, that someone has a right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, seize seizures, seizures, y'all, Y'all have a right to be free from unreasonable seizures. To say, for example, that someone has a right to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures by government agents, as the Fourth Amendment states, would mean nothing if a victim of... Uh, would mean nothing. God, I'm falling off here. Would mean nothing if a victim of such tyranny was obliged to allow it to happen at the time and then complain about it later. To have a right to be free from such oppression logically implies the right to use whatever force is required to stop such oppression from happening in the first place, even if that requires the killing of police officers. Did we violate the <laughs> Twitch Terms of Service yet? Woo! But the very thought terrifies those who have been trained to always bow to authority. Most of those who speak of unalienable rights still balk at the thought of forcibly defending those rights against authoritarian assaults. To say that someone has a right to do something, while also saying that he would not be justified in forcibly defending such a right against government incursions, is a contradiction. In truth, what most people call rights, they actually perceive as government-granted privileges, which they hope their masters will allow, but which they have no intention of forcibly protecting if such rights are outlawed by government. For example, to have an unalienable right to speak one's mind, the right to freedom of speech, means that the person also has the right to use whatever level of violence it takes, up to and including deadly force to defend against government agents who try to silence him. Though the point makes loyal believers in authority very uncomfortable, the very concept of a person having an unalienable right to do something also implies the right to kill any law enforcers who attempt to stop him from doing it. But in truth, there is almost nothing that government can do, whether it be censorship, assault, kidnapping, torture, or even murder, which would make the average statist advocate violent. Blech, blech. Oh, I messed that one up. I was doing good. But in truth. But in truth, there is almost nothing that government can do, whether it be censorship, assault. Can't I miss it up? But in truth, there is almost nothing that government can do, whether it be censorship, assault, kidnapping, torture, or even murder, which would make the average statist advocate violent, advocate, violent, illegal resistance. God. This is what it's like, guys. This is what it's like. Sometimes you just gotta, sometimes you just gotta, 
That is totally absurd. Still here I am. Kick ass. Bouncing across three streams at once. Cool. Been watching a lot more Twitch lately. It's been fun. All right, 17 times a charm. <coughs> Attempt to stop him from doing it. But in truth, there is almost nothing that government can do, whether it be censorship, assault, kidnapping, torture, or even murder which would make the average statist advocate violent, illegal resistance. Oh, got it! Finally! Woo. The reader is invited to test the depths of his own loyalty to the myth of authority by considering the question of what would have to happen before he himself would feel justified in killing a law enforcer. Boom. Everybody should ask themselves that. Everyone should ask themselves that question. Whew. What is y'all's answer? That's a good question. I think most people, like for me, because I'm a family guy, so I chose to have a family, a wife, and kids. My my responsibility is um, f has to be first and foremost to my children, and so like I would I would allow myself to be subjected to a lot more sort of tyranny before resisting. Um, so my line is my kids. If my kids start getting messed with, that's my line. And I think, I think a lot of people have that line, especially the kids. What y'all, what y'all think? What's your line? <sighs> Law enforcers constantly escalate disagreements to the level of violence. Every time they try to arrest someone, or force their way into someone's home, or forcibly take someone's property. And authoritarian enforcers will then keep increasing the level of violence they use until they get their way. The result is that the people, unless they are willing to engage in open revolution against the entire system, will sooner or later bow to the will of the ruling class or be killed. And though the mercenaries of the state are always using force, or the threat of force, to subdue and subjugate average people, the moment their intended victims respond to violence with violence, most spectators will instantly identify the victim of aggression, the one who used force only to defend against an attack as the bad guy. This glaring double standard the idea that it is okay for authority to commit violent acts of aggression on a regular basis, but horribly evil for the common folk to ever respond with defensive violence, shows how drastically the belief in authority can warp people's perception of reality. Ironically, in considering other places and other times, Almost everyone accepts and even praises the use of illegal violence, including deadly violence, against agents of government. Few people would still insist that the Jews who lived in 1940 Germany should have continued to try to work within the system by voting and petitioning the Third Reich for justice. Instead, those who illegally hid, ran away, or even forcibly resisted, as occurred in the Warsaw Ghetto, are now seen by almost everyone as having been justified in doing so, even though they were technically criminals, lawbreakers, and even cop killers. But authoritarians, in their own time and in their own country, not only continue to condemn any who illegally try to avoid or resist oppression, but cheerfully gloat over the suffering of such people when they are punished by government. To delight in a tax cheat being punished, for example, as many Americans do, is akin to a slave taking pleasure in the whipping of a fellow slave who tried to escape. There may be an aspect of simple envy in this, a feeling that if one subject has been victimized, it is not fair that another escaped such suffering. This contributes to the fact that taxpayers... No, 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 no. I'm not letting myself get away with that last one.
There may be an aspect of simple envy in this, a feeling that if one subject has been victimized, it is not fair that another escaped such suffering. This contributes to the fact that taxpayers, i.e. those who have been forcibly extorted by the ruling class, often express resentment of anyone who has avoided being similarly extorted. Oddly, the victims of legal robbery often imagine themselves to be virtuous for having been robbed and look down on those who, for whatever reason, have not been robbed. I don't want to stop. It's too good. How much more? Is... Okay, okay, okay. Last little... Okay, so two pages. Two pages and then we're done. The Danger of Inaction Oh, we got some responses. Let's see. Three guys, one mic. I know for sure if they come into my home without reason. I mean, knock and make yourself known if someone is all of a sudden in my home, I'm shooting first. I like this. The real OG Jesus from Twitch. What's up, man? How you doing? Welcome. We're working on an audiobook today. Larkin Rose's The Most Dangerous Superstition. One who views breaking the law as inherently bad, regardless of what the law is, may be quick to report to the authorities any illegal activities he is aware of, even if the activities are victimless and constitute neither force nor fraud. Likewise, those who sit on juries in government courtrooms, if they imagine disobedience to authority, breaking the law, to be inherently immoral, are likely to give their blessing to someone being punished, sometimes quite harshly, for doing something which harmed no one. Did my mic pop? Hold on. No, it didn't. Cool. Which harmed no one, and did not constitute either force or viol either fraud or violence. And did not constitute either fraud or violence. In the case of the snitch and the juror, however, such actions take... Man, just messing all this up here. Sometimes quite harshly. For doing something which harmed no one and did not constitute either fraud or violence. In the case of the snitch and the juror, however, such actions take one out of the role of a mere spectator and move him into the role of a collaborator of oppression. Boom. Jurors as collaborators of oppression. Oh man, this book's so good. The damage done by the belief in authority among the spectators of oppression comes more often from their inaction. Rather, their rather... Come on, come on Patrick, we're almost done. The damage done by the belief in authority among the spectators of oppression comes more often from their inaction. Nope. The damage done by the belief in authority among the spectators of oppression comes more often from their inaction rather than from their action. Time after time, oppressions, large and small, have been committed right under the noses of basically good people who did nothing about it. To a certain degree, this is the result of simple self-preservation. A person may avoid getting involved simply because he fears for his own safety. But the Milgram experiments showed quite clearly that even without any underlying threat to themselves, most people feel irresistibly compelled to obey authority even when they know that what they are being told to do is wrong and harmful to others. And if they find it difficult to disobey a perceived authority, they will find it even more difficult, if not impossible, to bring themselves to intervene when an authority is exerting its will on someone else. The result of the spectators having been trained to be passive, obedient, and non-confrontational can be seen in the many instances throughout the world and throughout history of dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of spectators. Standing around like standing around like zombies, watching as agents of authority assault or murder innocent people. 
Even in the United States, the supposed land of the free and home of the brave, videos continue to surface depicting police brutality occurring right in front of crowds of onlookers who simply stand and watch, not lifting a finger to protect their fellow man against the evils committed in the name of authority. Boom. It's the end of part, part 3D. Good stuff. Mmm, that was good. You do this often. Wait, you're making an audiobook. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I do audiobooks from time to time as part of my activism. And today we're kind of combining. I wanted to show people how I work on audiobooks while testing the new streaming platform that blasts it out across all of our stuff. We're typically on Facebook and YouTube, but we're trying to like spread out to BitTube and Twitch and maybe, what was the other one that somebody recommended? I'll go back, I'll, I'll look at it later. But anyway, yeah, we're trying to like, I want to bring all the different audiences together. We have like, we have gamers that we, we hang out with and have a blast with, and we do gamer things. And then we have like uh, liberty activists that do stuff like the feed the need, you know, armed, openly defying bad laws to feed the homeless while carrying weapons. We have street activist stuff. So we have street activists. We have, anyway, we have this guy writing amazing books. And, you know, part of my activism is to help people that have good comment, uh, good content, like amplify their message to the world. So in this case, doing, um, thanks ANCAP. Thanks uh, real OG Jesus for the follow. I appreciate it. That is awesome. We're trying to grow the Twitch channel, and, and the, the early follows especially are huge. But yeah, so um, we're helping. We're helping. We're, we're doing activism to help the world. That's what we do here at Disenthrall and the Nut Army. So today we're doing an audiobook. Other days we do other things. Uh, like I said, December 8th, we're doing Feed the Need. Um, uh, we'll probably try and live stream some of that stuff from the event. If you're in and around the Dallas, Texas area and want to defiantly break the bad law that makes it illegal to feed homeless in Texas, please check out the event. Um, you can find the event page on Facebook, Feed the Need 2018, uh, and you can find videos of it on YouTube. Feed the Need 5 will get you a good video on YouTube of what we did last year. It was really cool. We had like 60 people all armed to the teeth with pistols and assault rifles, all doing absolutely nothing wrong. We fed probably 300 people, and then we went back out at night, and literally, <laughs> it just blew my mind, there are people literally sleeping on concrete in the winter in Dallas, in like sometimes sub-zero temperatures, literally sleeping on concrete. I, I thought you would die if you did something like that. But these people do that every night. And so we, we walked out there and we found the people and we brought them tents and we brought them sleeping bags. And, you know, a month later the cops showed up and sliced open the tents and took everything um, because, you know, that's what cops do. They enforce bad laws. Anyway, so <laughs> that's coming up December 8th. That's probably the next big event on the channel. Other than that, we're playing games on Twitch. Uh, we're doing like current events commentary on the YouTube and Facebook channel uh, from an NCAP libertarian voluntarist perspective. So, um, dude, I'm going to call the this new this live stream, this restream uh, as like a huge success. Mixer, a uh, real OG followed sweet and an avid graffiti artist. You have my support. Thank you, sir. If you have work posted somewhere, give us a link. I'll go check it out. I'll probably join in soon. I try to go to Dallas often. Very cool. Um, you know, message me if you want any links to anything. I'm happy to hook you up. We're collecting donations now. Um, yeah, what time is it? What time is it? I might play some games. It's 2 a.m. Yeah, I'll probably play a little hots or watch somebody else stream for a while. This was a blast. I call this like a huge success. This is awesome. We have all the audiences from the different platforms communicating and I had fun sharing how I work on audiobooks. Maybe we'll do this again in the future. I had I got permission from Larkin to live stream this. Obviously, this is his content. And I figured because we were doing it from the phone, um, the audio quality wouldn't really be high enough that anyone would care to try and like grab this and not steal. You know, Larkin does obviously not believe in IP, but um, we could share the experience, get you guys pumped about the audiobook coming out and the good things we're doing. And uh, yeah, so I think it was I think it kicked ass. I'll talk to you guys soon. This is awesome. I really love this. Very cool guys. I will catch you later. Signing out.